Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, a huge thank you to PHG. I I've worked with them over many years, and particularly on the personalised medicine report that uh, Mark outlined earlier. And, uh, this, and I hope that those collaborations uh, will continue. So I'm going to talk about the evolution of genomics in the NHS um, that was focused around establishing an ecosystem to support both high quality care, but also the effective translation of science into practice. So it was continually evolving, continually uh, embedding evidence uh, from uh, scientific endeavours wherever they're performed. I want to start by really setting out you know, the landscape of, of, of genomic medicine because the UK has been in the, the forefront of genomics worldwide and just next week we'll celebrate 70 years since the discovery of, of DNA. But we've been at the start, uh, at the centre of research and innovation through a variety of different initiatives, including the 100,000 Genomes Project and UK Biobank. The NHS enables us to use um, not only the long history of providing services, but also because it is centrally funded and we can drive uh, change at scale and pace. And we have wonderful organisations like MHRA and NICE. We also, though, have a very vibrant life sciences and industry uh, sector and the political will. And it's all those different partners coming together that really is critical to actually ensuring that the NHS, that the UK remains at the forefront of genomics going forward. So this was a recent report published by the National Academies of Science in, uh, in the US and it recognised a number of different challenges for embedding genomics. And I hope what I'm going to show you is within the NHS Genomic Medicine Service, we've addressed a number of these challenges. But just read the quote at the bottom. Having a national health service allows for the uptake of genomics rapidly and at scale. And it's been individuals who've championed genomics whether at a national level or a more local level, that have been important for the changes that we've actually seen. Last October, we published the very first um, NHS genomics strategy. It's a five-year strategy that set out the vision uh, around the power of genomics in predicting, preventing and diagnosing disease, but importantly, in targeting treatment. And that this approach would be accessible to all as part of routine care. It aligns with the NHS long-term plan, genomic commitments, and also aligns with all of the clinical priority commitments for cancer, for cardiovascular disease. It aligns with Genome UK, which set out a 10-year vision for how we would achieve progress in areas such as diagnosis and personalised medicine, and it also aligns with the UK life sciences vision. Importantly, the four themes cover the first theme, having an innovative service model that is a, with a national infrastructure and an infrastructure that is, is funded uh, from within central funding. That it delivers equitable testing and it is aligned with that precision treatment and medicine and with, it reduces adverse drug reactions. It enables genomics to be at the forefront of data and, and digital uh, and the revolution there so that it can bring together genomic data with other clinical data to inform genotype phenotype correlations and it, it committed to evolving the service by aligning with cutting edge science research and innovation. The NHS genomic medicine service that we launched in 2018 offers that access to comprehensive genomic testing through seven genomic laboratory hubs that are commissioned nationally, with an embedding function delivered by seven genomic medicine service alliances, and with a clinical genomics service delivered by 17 clinical genomics units, and with a strategic partnership with Genomics England, particularly in the provision of the whole genome sequencing service. On the right-hand side of those seven areas, they don't quite align with NHS regions, uh, but it, that's only 
in, in two main uh, areas there. But what the principles driving this embedding in 2018 was that patients and public would be involved at all levels. There would be a standardised model of delivery and contracting. And at that moment in 2018, we had a tripling of the investment and we have year-on-year -year growth in terms of investment. It would be clinically and scientifically led and responsive to innovation and new technologies. We'd use data to drive insights and we'd align, as I've already mentioned, routine care with research and innovation to drive a continual learning system. This is a new approach to genomic medicine and embedding genomics. So it's beyond a small focused approach within the NHS, for example, through clinical genetics, to broadening this out to all specialties. So it's about a multi-specialty uh, approach, uh, and that includes actually having funded clinical, scientific and informatics leadership within that structure I've just uh, outlined. It's about this being multi-professional, so inclu including all the professional groups that will touch on uh, a patient having genomic testing or the outcome of genomic testing uh, within uh, the NHS. It involves cross-professional involvement in genomic MDTs. And it's about being multi-regional, so working in networks and with the genomic unit within NHS England on the development of operational policies and strategies. So it's both national and local. So we develop policies and strategies that are implementable. Expertise is shared across the country and some services are only provided nationally in terms of cost effectiveness, but also because of the sample size number. This is just an example of one of those NHS Genomic Medicine Service Alliance structures from North Thames. What this actually shows you is from that overarching genomic medicine service and the different components, this is what this tra translates to at a local level. In all of those different elements, including research and development, infrastructure and data, education and training, patient and public involvement, as well as the genomic laboratory hubs, the clinical genomic services. But then with additional layers from, for example, clinical senates that bring in representatives from across the geography, and North Thames serve a population of 5 million, Central and South serve a population of 10 million. So we will only embed if it comes out into other uh, specialties. And you can see on the left side, I've already mentioned, the working with NHS England in partnership through different boards and working groups to make this happen. A key part of ensuring that we have a, a universal offer that will drive equity of access is through the National Genomic Test Directory. This is a mandated test directory. It's mandated in terms of this is what's funded and this is what is available for eligible patients. It covers the full repertoire of testing. There's opportunities to include uh, multi-omics and it will evolve over time. There's approximately uh, 3,200 3, rare diseases covered uh, within the test directory and over 200 cancer clinical indications. And it's updated at, uh, annually. This process is run from within NHS England with test evaluation groups that review the evidence. A year ago, we made 150 changes to the test directory. We just published the latest one that now uh, sees whole genome sequencing being available for sudden explained cardiac death in childhood and also for cancer of unknown primary. But what it does do is cement whole genome sequencing as central to service delivery. In rare diseases, the testing that's outlined on this slide, including the specialist areas, and also pharmacogenomic testing for specific uh, uh, variants um, is delivered from either one or all seven of those genomic uh, laboratory hubs. It covers the complete life course, it includes NIPD, and it includes reanalysis. So going back and reanalyzing the whole genomes uh, in the case of diagnostic discovery. <laughs> Last year, approximately 
three, uh, 380,000 rare disease tests were included. And you can see that whole genome sequencing is now available for 33 clinical indications. We have a number of national rapid services, including a rapid whole genome sequence service delivered from Exeter for acutely unwell children, and a rapid whole exome sequence uh, service for fetal anomalies uh, delivered from Great Ormond Street, led by Lynn Chitty in the audience here, and also from uh, Birmingham. And you can see the type of diagnostic yields we're getting from these services in these rapid services are over 40%. They, in general, all lead to some management or treatment decision. This is our cancer genomic testing strategy that's focused on germline testing, and we'll be expanding that, that testing. Also on circulating tumour DNA, but I think from what Dennis has told us this morning, there's lots more that we need to do to make sure uh, that, that our patients can, can benefit from all the different analysis of, of using these new and innovative uh, techniques. But it also includes, for example, pharmacogenomic germline testing for DPYD, which confers adverse drug reactions for the fluoroperimidines. Interestingly, in terms of our focus rapid testing, we've introduced treatment determining large next generation sequencing panels, including DNA and RNA targets that cover all of the current clinical trials that, um, may, that patients may be eligible to enter. And as part of a development with NICE, with the Commercial Medicines Unit uh, and with others, we will be looking at a two year horizon scan for including those targets. Uh, uh, we have 157 clinical indications for cancer. Cancer only came in to be part of the testing service in 2018 as part of the NHS Genomic Medicine Service. And generally, the testing didn't get started until around 2021 for a number of reasons. Since that time, and between 20, April 21 and December 22, there's been over 600,000 cancer genomic tests and over 100,000 next generation sequencing panels. And we have about 300,000 new uh, cancer genomic uh, diagnoses any, every year. So this is from a standing start and achieved over a five year period. Our whole genome sequencing service went live in the middle of COVID and included at that time 21 rare diseases and three cancers. You can see that that's been expanded since. This is in a partnership with Genomics England and also with sequencing through a third party provider, Illumina. Since the service went live, nearly 50,000 whole genomes have been sequenced, the majority in rare disease. And in rare disease, we have an average diagnostic yield of about a third and in cystic renal disease of over 60%. So this is a new innovation uh, coming into healthcare, requiring all the re-engineering of pathways in reporting arrangements and in uh, uh, feeding back in terms of uh, clinical teams. Part of the key tenet of the genomic medicine service and the strategy is developing precision medicine pathways, both to support more precision and accelerated diagnostics, more targeted personalized uh, interventions such as uh, using NTRAC uh, testing or enabling that uh, for genetic profiling of, of cancers, driving fewer adverse uh, drug reactions through, for example, DPYD, but also uh, starting to look at the outcome from matching genomic testing with precision medicines and capturing that data, which we don't do at the moment. And I've already mentioned our work with partners to try and horizon scan, and then to link this with medicines governance and optimization. Through this process, we'll drive the use of precision medicines right through from gene therapies through to repurposing of medicines and predicting uh, drug resistance and, and pathogen resistance. The enablers making this possible are, for the first time, we're able to collect data about the service to monitor process, whether that's turnaround times, whether it's population level data, whether it's understanding geographies with the greatest need 
in terms of the eligible conditions or population segmentation, which we're starting to do. There's a number of different challenges and later this summer, we'll publish for the very first time our genomic testing turnaround times and activity. Data and digital developments are also a key enabler. As part of that is the NHS infrastructure and interoperability to make this happen. And I can't underestimate how much of a challenge this actually is. Um, and this is to enable, have an infra infrastructure to link within existing systems. Um, there's both developments in Genomics England in terms of their ongoing improvements to the bioinformatics pipelines and interpretation tools working with the NHS, but also native NHS bioinformatics pipelines driving uh, the more rapid uh, genome sequence service from Exeter. We've established a new NHS Genomics Data and Digital Board that will oversee all of the developments and that will include moving to data standardisation, improving access and functionality because in non-whole genome sequencing data we need to standardise it to enable it to be shared both within country and internationally and we'll be developing a national longitudinal genomic record. Now, genomics education is also critical to this both in terms of proactive and reactive learning, in very specific learning around clinical pathway initiatives for the multi-professional team, in having education and training leads and genomic training academies to do things differently for the whole of the workforce, not just those in specialist uh, genetic roles, and then how we start to raise awareness. And there's a raft of different programmes in pharmacy and nursing and midwifery and in, and in medicine with the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges to support that systematic uh, embedding. So the 100,000 Genomes Project was a proof of concept project. It transformed elements of the NHS to enable us to introduce the NHS Genomic Medicine Service that I've outlined. It also gave us a number of diagnostic outcomes. At that time, from whole genome sequencing and rare disease, it was about 25%. But in cancer, about 50% of actionable findings were highlighted. But it built the evidence for whole genome sequencing as a diagnostic test. It established the mechanism to collaborate with industry. And it uh, pioneered the sharing of de-identified data and a springboard for the National Genomic Research Library. The NHS GMS Research Collaborative is a partnership between Genomics England and NHR, and it's the, this infinity loop describes what we're trying to achieve here through evolving genomic healthcare by accelerating genomic research and particularly the data that's curated by genomic, uh, Genomics England and, be, and can be accessed by researchers worldwide. That's led to a, over 1,200 putative diagnostic discoveries returned back to the NHS. But through the collaborative, we're also working with industry, with academics and with others to support a range of different projects that can access the NHS genomic medicine infrastructure, the data, the samples and the reach in to patients. The NHS genomic medicine service itself supports 900 research projects which I was amazed at in terms of the number, this research collaborative is driving new projects and new initiatives and driving that adoption pathway and a continuous lear learning uh, cycle. NH the NHS Genomic Medicine Service will be supporting Genomics England for future proof of concept projects in pathways to rapid adoption in the NHS in terms of newborn sequencing that you'll hear about this afternoon uh, from Richard Scott, in long read sequencing that Matt Brown is actually leading in Genomics England working with NES, NHS, in terms of diverse data making our reference data sets appropriate and also in multimodal data, bringing data together so that we get an enriched phenotype-genotype correlation from the data that arises from genomics. 
There are a number of different transformation projects that we've supported from NHS England in the NHS GMS, and I'm nearly finished now, uh, Annika. And one I want to pick up on is Progress, which is a two-year project on pharmacogenomics. They've developed and validated a pharmacogenomic uh, panel, developed the informatics solution, and are waiting ethics approval to undertake a pilot in general practice. That will be game-changing when we're able to do that. In monogenic diabetes, through these projects, we've doubled the number of monogenic diabetes cases that have been identified similarly in Lynch syndrome. And a really innovative project with sudden cardiac death, including the coronal system and the British Heart Foundation, trying to identify the cause of sudden cardiac death in the index case, but also find family members but then driving cha technological change in RNA sequencing and long-read uh, DNA sequencing for rare disease. We're just about to um, close or on the 5th of May our deadline for the NHS Genomic Networks of Excellence that will bring together and leverage the funding in the system, in academia, in industry, together with the funding that we'll make available in NHS England to drive evidence and models of adoption uh, for the NHS, so we can really close down that adoption uh, window. Um, and this is partly how do we leverage other money in the system together with the NHS money. But this will inform an NHS industry partnership framework for rapid adoption of technologies and ongoing uh, collaborative working with our su su uh, suppliers. Just to finish, what we do has, of course, numerous benefits uh, from patients, including baby Oliver being sa saved uh, chemotherapy and extensive surgery for what turned out to be uh, a, a, a non-malignant myofibroma, through to um, using LAMP technology for detecting aminoglycoside ototoxicity in newborns, but also to the grey orb patients and many other different areas. The challenges we face remain changing end to end pathways and service models in ethical elements such as working at the speed of public acceptance and a choice and consent model that's, uh, that's fit for purpose and supports research, for example, in retaining public trust in our diversity of data and continuing to develop our workforce. Looking forward, um, International collaboration is important. We're uh, one of the only genomic medicine services in the world, and therefore we get um, lots of requests to talk to many different countries about how we've established and aligned routine care uh, with research. But I do think we're at a tipping point. We have to move towards multimodality technologies, and Dennis <coughs> made that, um, that point very strongly this morning. But we also look, need to look across the whole of the functional genomic pathway. But I think we are at the start of that embedding genomics across the whole of the NHS. And this is just my summary that I can leave <coughs> you with. And thank you very much. <coughs>